Hello, my name is Marat. I'm a PhD student in medicinal chemistry and on this channel we're talking about stocks. Today I would like to start a series of videos about CRISPR-related companies that in one or the other way connected to the technology. And of course I would like to start with the first public company in this space, CRISPR Therapeutics. Let's go. Since this is the first video in the series about CRISPR stocks, I would like to outline here how CRISPR works, some terms that you should be familiar with if you invest in this type of companies, and then I will show you some cool video to show how CRISPR actually works in action. In spite of complex structure, DNA consists of four main ingredients, nucleotides, and they called adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine, or AGTC for short. Then we have to define gene, because we're using CRISPR technology to modify faulty genes. And gene is just a short sequence of DNA that encode proteins or RNA. And even a single mistake in this code, for instance, if you change letter from A to C or any other AGTC letters will be interchanged, it can result in a deadly disease. People start thinking about modifying genes as a way to treat disease from early times when DNA structure was discovered. And in 90s, first gene editing techniques start to appear on market. Early techniques that were used for gene editing were called zinc fingers and talons. And they were quite labor intensive and require a lot of time and were error prone. So they were able to generate not only targeted mutations, but offsite mutations quite often. And when finally CRISPR arrived on the scene, everyone was excited because it allowed for more precise target gene editing and it was less laborious as well. So people could spend less time and being more efficient. And this is why everyone started talking about CRISPR the moment it arrived. And the beauty of CRISPR-Cas9 as a gene editing tool that it was derived from bacteria. So it's actually naturally created and then slightly modified by humans. So it offer higher precision because it's utilizing the nature. And thus, CRISPR technology offers a straightforward way to modify genes and turn so-called bad genes into normal genes that would provide normal proteins to the body. And now, as we briefly touched on how CRISPR-Cas9 system works as a gene editing tool, I would like to show you two videos side by side. One of them is taken from CRISPR Therapeutics website that's showing you schematically how CRISPR-Cas9 works, and the other one is actually filmed with a microscope and you can see how it's actually done in nature. And I'm so amazed that we can see right now these tiny processes inside. CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing process begins when the complex recognizes and binds to a short segment of DNA adjacent to the target site. This initiates unwinding of the DNA helix, which allows the guide RNA to pair with a specific target sequence in the DNA. If the sequences pair precisely, Cas9 cuts the DNA, forming a double strand break. Now, as we discuss CRISPR-Cas9 as a technology, it's time to go to the CRISPR Therapeutics website. And when you're on the website, for all biotech companies, what you're mostly interested in is pipeline. When we press programs, we can open pipeline. And as you can see that they have four candidates that are in a clinical trials right now. So and let's focus first on this CTX001. And as you can see, it's used for treatment of sickle cell anemia and beta thalassemia. And as you can see that they share ownership of this program with Vertex. And it's a good news, I would say, for a small company like CRISPR Therapeutics that's just about to start because Vertex, the established company that will help them to bring this drug to the market and commercialize it. But on the downside, of course, they will have to share the profit from this drug with Vertex. It's worth mentioning is that in this CTX001, they're using disruption as a technology. So they're not actually changing faulty gene with a normal gene, but rather they disrupt genes that stop production of fetal hemoglobin. As you can see, for more information on this drug, we can click here and we'll proceed to this link. And here they just describe in more details what this disease is all about and how common these diseases are and how they're planning to treat it. So let's start with explaining how they approach in this treatment. As I mentioned, that they're trying to switch off genes that silencing fetal hemoglobin production. So, and on this graph, you can see that 
when you're in the womb, so this is minus nine months before birth, and then when you're approaching your birth date at zero months, fetal hemoglobin level is just dropping down at around three months. It's already starting showing the symptoms of sickle cell or beta thalassemia because you're switching to your own hemoglobin that is found in all adults. And what they're trying to achieve with this treatment is to switch back on production of fetal hemoglobin. And they showed in clinical trials some promising data that it seems to work, at least in the short period of time, because they need definitely more observation of this treatment to make sure that this is actually working treatment. On this scheme, they're actually explaining how this treatment is going to work and how it's already working because it's in the clinical trials. So they taking blood from a patient, then they isolate from this blood specific cells and it's called CD34 plus cells. Then using this method of delivery electroporation, which is only good for ex vivo, so outside of human body, because you just apply some electricity to open up the cell membrane and then deliver this CRISPR-Cas9. So it's no way you can deliver with electroporation inside a human being. And then they just using this CRISPR technology to disrupt gene that is basically stopping production of fetal hemoglobin. And then they have modified cells that will be infused back to your body. The idea is that this is one-off treatment and you should be okay till the rest of your life with this type of treatment. And as you can see that they discharge patient after this procedure of infusion of the modified blood cells. And then only in a follow-up, they will be just checking on you and see if it's progressing in a good way, if your fetal hemoglobin production is started and if everything is normal. I'm not going to stop at specific aspects of these diseases because you can read it for yourself from some more repeatable sources as I'm not medical professional, but instead we want to focus on numbers that are connected to these diseases. You can see that annual births is 300,000 with sickle cell disease and another 60,000 with beta thalassemia. It's devastating for people who are born with this disease or for their families, but for companies that are producing medicine for this disease, of course, it's kind of a good news that you have such a huge market to work with and it sounds evil, but at the end of the day, it's all business and pharma companies are blamed for making profit from disease, but this is our reality and like we don't have any other way to do it. It's estimated that around 4.4 million of people living with sickle cell disease and what is especially unfortunate is that more than 80% of them living in sub-Saharan Africa region. And it's all connected to malaria. So when you have sickle cell disease, you're kind of resistant to malaria, or at least malaria will be milder for you, and you're likely to survive from malaria, but you eventually gonna die in the young age from just sickle cell disease. And normal life expectancy in developed countries with sickle cell disease around 42, 47 years. So it's definitely decreased life expectancy compared to non-diseased human being. Out of 4.4 million of people who have sickle cell disease, 100,000 living in the US and another 52,000 living in Europe. And why I'm mentioning this? Because only these people will be able to afford this medicine initially. I can't imagine that it will be that cheap that some African countries would be buying it in bulk rather than just like, you know, few wealthy people who can afford this. When we're talking about market opportunity for CRISPR therapeutics in the field of beta thalassemia and sickle cell anemia, we have to estimate what kind of price tag they will put on this medicine. And I guess the best way to predict the price tag would be to compare to other gene therapies. And some gene therapies can go as high as 2.1 million for Zolgensma, and this is officially the most expensive drug in the world. And some other CAR T cell based therapies from cancer, like Kimrai is the first one in class, it's cost around $450,000. So I would say that probably, even if they will try to make it cheaper, they're not gonna make it cheaper than 0 0.3 millions. This is just my estimate, and I feel, I mean, it could be way off the real price, but this is what we are going to use for this estimate. And if we take 0 0.3 millions for one treatment, 
10% of US market would be equivalent to 30 billion dollars and then 10% of European market would be additional 15.6 billion dollars. And I believe that they probably will be able to deliver these numbers based on the assumption that more wealthy people with this disease will be able to afford it as soon as it's on the market because they have insurance or they just rich enough to buy it with their own money. And when we're talking about recurring revenue from this drug, because in Europe and US, 4,000 people born with this disease annually, we can estimate that it's another more than 1 billion per year if these people will be covered with the insurance. And I believe at some point this will be the case. From the investor standpoint of view, it's very important to estimate when the medicine will be on the market. And the best way to estimate it is going to a clinical trial page and see what kind of completion they are proposing themselves. So, and for this CTX001 clinical trials against sickle cell disease, you can see that estimated primary completion is already in February, so it's kind of a few months ago. And estimated study completion date, this is what we're interested in in May 2022. So, and in some exceptional cases, FDA could give a clearance after phase two under special circumstances for especially severe cases where a patient is most likely going to die without treatment and you have basically more chances of benefiting from this treatment rather than making any harm. And in these type of cases, I believe that they can get approval as early as May 2022 and maybe even earlier because you can see that primary completion day is February 2021. And if you find this video useful so far, please leave a like and subscribe as I'm planning to continue discussing CRISPR related companies and other biotech stocks. And this is very important. If they will get approval in May 2022 or even earlier at some point this year, they will be ahead of their competitors by at least two years. And during these two years time, they will have monopoly for this time frame before any other company will get approval for their treatment. And this is why you can see that CRISPR Therapeutics has a high valuation compared to other CRISPR related companies because they are further in their clinical trials and they expected to deliver drug to the market sooner compared to their competitors. And closer competitor to CRISPR Therapeutics in terms of treating sickle cell disease is Intelli Therapeutics and they just started the clinical trials in August 2020. And if you compare these to CRISPR therapeutics, which started clinical trials two years prior to that, so they definitely have this advantage. And if you're talking about other competitors, editors, they got approval to proceed to clinical trials with this treatment for sickle cell disease. And beam therapeutics, they still waiting for the approval to proceed to clinical trials. So they definitely few years behind. If you're going back to CRISPR therapeutics pipeline and look at the immune oncology part, you can see that another three drugs are in clinical trials. But if you're looking at the estimated completion date, for instance, for the CTX110, it says in July 2026, August 2026. For the another candidate, it's in 2027 and another also 2027. And these drugs are so far away from market that I'm not going to discuss it in the details as of right now. I may do another video on this whole therapy based on CAR T cells as a separate video. But for now, in the next five years, CRISPR Therapeutics is not planned to make any profit from these drugs. And they will be primarily focused on beta thalassemia and sickle cell disease. Then I would like to mention a few words about CEO of CRISPR Therapeutics. As you can see, it's somewhat cool carny. So, and I believe that this guy is great as a CEO because you can see that he received his education as a scientist. So he did his PhD in bioengineering and nanotechnology. And then he went to work as a scientist for some time. But after this, he joined McKenzie and company. So he got business experience and science experience at the same time. And then he joined CRISPR Therapeutics after this business experience. And in CRISPR Therapeutics, he was in several roles before actually getting position of CEO. And I believe in this company to have as a CEO, somebody who has strong background in science, but also strong background in a business 
it's a win-win situation because they definitely have to market their drugs, but also a CEO should understand what's going on with the pipeline. When we're talking about leadership of CRISPR therapeutics, I would like to mention these guys as well, Philippe Duret, because he was appointed as a chief commercial officer in February 2021. And what is so interesting about this, that they're definitely getting ready to commercialize a product because otherwise who needs chief commercial officer? And if you look at his profile, so you can see that he started in Novartis and was working in Novartis, I don't know, like for more than 10 years. Then he went to another pharmaceutical company. Then he transitioned to Merck. And after five years in Merck, he joined as a chief commercial officer, CRISPR Therapeutics. So definitely this guy has plenty of experience in commercializing products. And it's so great to see such an experienced person in this position for CRISPR Therapeutics. And at the end, I just want to have a look at the balance sheet of CRISPR Therapeutics. And as you can see that they have in total assets 1.1 billions and in current assets 1.7 billion so basically they are sitting on a pile of cash while total liability is just 160 million so it's basically nothing and if you look at the income statement we can see that operational expenses 355 millions of dollars and mainly it's connected to the research and development spending and it's good to see that research and development spending is increasing because this is innovative company and you want to see more money being thrown into the research and development compared to these sales and administrative fees. And I believe that even if research and development keep increasing, because definitely this is what we want to see and this is what most likely is going to happen, even with this increase in research development spending, they will start generating revenue in probably one or two years from the main drug candidate CTX001. And this money that they have, 1.7 billion, should be enough to maintain their operation for this time frame. Overall, I believe that CRISPR therapeutics will bring a lot of good news to their shareholders and patients in the next couple of years, as I expect FDA approval for CTX001 for severe patients with severe sickle cell and beta thalassemia cases where no other treatment is available and benefit definitely will be greater than the risk and they will start generate revenue from this and the valuation for the company definitely will increase from this news. I would expect to see valuation for CRISPR therapeutics at around 30 to 50 billion after approval of CTX001 and then if more news will be coming from the pipeline valuation could be even higher. They definitely have a strong team to commercialize their products and they have a lot of cash to continue the operation for at least two to three years without any offerings. However, if you're talking about long-term future, let's say 10 years or more for CRISPR therapeutics, I'm not sure if they will be still leader in the field because beam therapeutics is advancing quite rapidly and in spite having zero clinical trials going on, they have valuation at around 5 billion, while CRISPR therapeutics has four clinical trials running right now and they have valuation at 9 billion. My next video will be about beam therapeutics and if you want to learn more about them subscribe to my channel and see you in the next one.